Hello, Eugene Aiello. I am here on my uh, third video broadcast of this series. Um, first two, I got a little heavy on talking about charge separation and how charge separation absorbs into biologic systems and how it's going to be useful down the road as we start describing this biophotonic model. Um, I'm going to take a kind of a step back and uh, we're going to have to discuss what exactly electromagnetic energy is. I keep bringing it up, but I, I think it'd be prudent at this point just to uh, discuss the qualities of it. Um, what is electromagnetic energy? Electromagnetic energy is basically a wave. It's, it's energy that has two components to it. It's got an electrical oscillation, which is the wave property of it, and it's got a magnetic spin. And what I mean by this is that the very tip of electromagnetic energy is a photon. It's a massless packet of energy. Um, that massless packet of energy carries with it an electron os electrical oscillation, but it also has a magnetic spin to it. So I, I, when I think of a photon, I actually, because it's hard to conceive, when you get to the quantum level, um, quantum level is, is hard to comprehend because we think of things in classical physics where it has a material possession, material um, nature to it. So for my mind to conceive it, I always kind of picture a photon as just being this, this massive light. It's not really, but massive energy that is spinning and it's bouncing up and down in that area. How is an electromagnetic wave produced? Um, electromagnetic wave is produced, if you want to go to the simplest, you can look at how radio waves are made in a radio tower. Um, a radio tower is going to have a conductive material of metal and what's going to happen in there is they're going to keep oscillating that charge back and forth. Depending on how quickly that oscillation of charge is happening depends on the frequency of the wave emitted from it. Um, usefulness for this with radio frequency communication is you can create this wave of oscillation, which can then be received by an antenna, the receiver, and it's going to create that same wave of oscillation within that conducting material then that can be sent to a receiver. They're, they're, I'm being simple again. There's a lot more to it than that, but whatever that pattern of oscillation of electrons can be reproduced at the receiver and it can travel through the air and it travels at the speed of light. So these different frequencies matter. Different frequencies of electromagnetic energy have a quality. As you increase the frequency, you're decreasing the wavelength. So the separation between, as you're increasing that frequency, you're getting smaller wavelengths. As you increase that frequency, you're also increasing the amount of energy within that photon. So I discussed it very briefly earlier, how you've got an atom with a nucleus, and it has these theoretic clouds of electrons around them. And these electrons can absorb this energy. And when they absorb this energy, it can excite them to a higher level which makes the transfer of that electron to occur more likely. So that's how we're creating charge separation. We're absorbing that energy from EM, and then we're putting it into an electron that gets a little more likely to do something. Without the electromagnetic absorption occurring, if two nearby molecules are kind of bumping around next to each other, the likelihood of interaction is going to be less at current state, but when you add electromagnetic energy absorption into that molecule, now the two electron clouds are more likely to interact. Um, this is important because, as I spoke before about enzymes, an enzyme is a catalyst of a reaction. So by making this more likely to happen, it's going to happen more rapidly. So back to the basics of electromagnetic energy. Above here, I have the frequency range starting from zero going all the way up to, I believe it's yottahertz, I can't remember, um, very high frequencies. We're talking 10 to the power of, I don't even remember, but it's high. So kilohertz would be here, megahertz would be there, gigahertz would be there, terahertz. After that, I didn't put it in there because we're not going to discuss. But to give you a sense, radio wave frequencies that we use for communication are in this kilohertz, megahertz to the lower end of gigahertz range. Microwaves are a section of the radio waves, the radio frequencies. It's just a higher frequency area where the waves are very small. The sun, it's emitting 
lots of different waves within this middle part of the spectrum. Very rarely is it emitting radio waves. And radio waves emitted from the sun can go right directly to the surface of the earth. There's no atmospheric absorption of radio waves. Um, far infrared, middle infrared. So this is infrared spectrum here to there, far, middle, near. These far and middle infrareds are gonna be absorbed quite a bit by the atmosphere, mainly water vapor. Near infrared energy, visible light, UVA and most of UVB is gonna make it through the atmosphere. The reason I'm bringing that up, these are the types of solar energies that are hitting the pigment systems of our skin. So it's gonna be very important later when we discuss the pigment system and how it takes on different energies. Um, later on, we're gonna be discussing these because these different interactions, these different produced waves, I call it ambient, EM, pollution. These things are with us 24 seven. Our body was made to experience these different frequencies only in short bursts during solar events. Our 24-7 exposure of this ambient electromagnetic energy is going to have a major play a major factor in interactions with our body's natural system. So we're going to get into that pretty far in detail later, but I thought it was important first to get a little bit of a breakdown of what electromagnetic energy is. Another part that I think is worth mentioning Right around this frequency range is a very important range. It divides out non-ionizing radiation versus ionizing radiation. And what does that mean? Um, we're we're going to apply it to biologic materials because that's what it's going to affect differently. So the energy that's in the ionizing radiation is strong enough that when it hits biologic tissues, it's going to pop out those electrons. It has enough energy to make that electron leap from the cloud. If you remember what I said earlier, these pigments absorbing the visible light spectrum, these frequencies are enough just to excite electrons to make the probability higher. Um, when we get to the quantum concepts later on, quantum tunneling, they're going to be able to get that electron to a high enough level that the tunneling effect of that electron can occur. So back when we talked about cytochromes and oxygen, that electron is getting excited, but it's eventually going to be quantum tunneled into that oxygen molecule and create the reactive oxygen species. Back on this topic, ionizing radiation, when it emits these electrons from biologic tissues, what did I say earlier about that? Not very safe. If these electrons get bound, bump and jump to a protein, DNA, or a lipid, they're going to denature them. That's why we have pigments in our skin that are absorbing that UV light, the melanin pigment. It's going to be blocking this UV radiation that's still getting through, and it's going to prevent us from getting mutations within our genetic material, but that would only be pretty much skin deep. Those UV lights, they're not getting past the skin. So just like I talked about red light hitting our skin and absorbing into it, and that must be part of a system of transfer that goes throughout the whole body. UV light is really going to only have its carcinogenic effect at the skin level. UV light's not getting into the brain, so brain cancers aren't going to be caused by UV light, which will be a topic again, I keep saying, later on. Um, Non-ionizing non radiation is just doing this electron excitation, and that's the rationale of why we are told that this area of the spectrum is safe. It's not carcinogenic because it's not strong enough. And it's pretty weak if you look at versus where the visible light is. We're in terahertz. We're talking a lot lower frequencies in here. So a lot less energy is within these radio waves and microwaves that are hitting us 24-7 from all the different communication systems we have. So with that rationale, they're saying, this is completely safe. It's not affecting us. But they're also not considering the fact that this energy is moving into a system. Conventional science doesn't even discuss that electromagnetic energy happens in the mitochondria when it obviously is occurring. So this system can be altered and it's gonna be a big part of my lecture series by these things. These different things should not be hitting us and our bodies are trying to adapt to that 
and it's shifting how our frequencies are being absorbed in our system. So hopefully that was a good brief for people that are not familiar with electromagnetic energy or a refresher for people like myself who, when I first started reading about this topic, I learned it in college, but it wasn't something that was on my radar as a practicing physician until I started doing a little more research and found out that I really should have been paying attention to electromagnetic energy. As an acupuncturist, I, I worked with energy medicine, if you want to call it that, the concept of chi flow. Um, I couldn't understand it. I, I, I knew that there was something to acupuncture because clinically I saw results from it, but it was this mystical, confusing energy to me. I believed, because I'm conventionally trained in science, that it had to have been an electrical quality. It had to be a frequency of low-level current that wasn't measurable, that somehow that energy with an electricity within our body was doing all the different reactions. When, when I talked about the enzymes and things like that, that somehow electrical flow within a system in our body was accomplishing that. Um, when I made my discovery using that cold red laser and finding how that interacted with the system is when I started appreciating that this area is very important to our body and our body's utilizing it. And that's going to be the major topic of this whole series is biophotonics, how we're absorbing that electromagnetic energy and what the Chinese believed was qi is a system that exists, but it fits more into a conventional model than my training in Chinese medicine led me to believe. Um, I moved away from the mystics of meridians and channels and the concept of chakras, and I started realizing that there's a system that we already knew about, and it's paralleling our nervous system. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, we're going to move on to the next topic in the next video. And yes, I, as I said in the first video, if anybody ever has questions, I'm always open for emails. I'll respond pretty quick. So I hope you watch my next video.